when I got into film, what did I, one of the first films I worked on was probably The Lone Ranger. I don't know when that was, 2012 or 2011, but that was such a small team. There was literally probably 10, 10 animators on that. And so I had it good with coming in, it was that MPC, so it's a big studio, but the team on that project was quite small. And we just focused on the Scorpions. And because it was so small, you got to know the team, you got to know your project. It was just like, I thought that's how film was, okay? Then my next project in film was the total opposite, was Guardians of the Galaxy. And that was humongous. You know, you're looking at nearly 100 animators. So I'm going from 10 animators and just doing some math, 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 math. <laughs> you know, math, and then it becomes a hundred and you run a big, massive Marvel project yeah. and it's all character performance, action, and you know, you got to do Rocket the Raccoon, you got to do Groot and you want to get stuck in, but at the same time, you've got to learn about visual effects and how you're doing live action plates. You've got to learn the pipeline. You've got to learn how to do all this stuff. So it's not just animation. You've got to understand the scenes and how it works in the sequence, all this. And I'm fairly new to film. I've done animation before, I've done TV, I've done video games, but this is now another beast. Mm -hmm. And you start to realize, oh my gosh, this is all new to me again. It's another new mm -hmm. kind of environment. And like I said, I've got 10 years behind me. And then you've got people who just come straight out, out of school, online school, brick and mortar school, and they're in the same trench and you see them and they're like, these in headlights, do you know what I mean? It's like, you've got a hundred animators, you've got probably about 10 leads, you know, the way they div it up. But then you've got to ask yourself, has the lead, because it's a fast paced show, has the lead got time to teach or train all of these juniors, or all these mids to get up to the standard? Because your leads are up there, do you know what I mean? They've been doing this film stuff for, for time. And then you've got graduates who are just coming in. And they're just looking at them like, oh my gosh, mm. what the, and the lead can't do their work for them, but he's got to train them. She's got to help them. She's got to do all this. So I don't envy graduates now, actually, because it yeah. is a, it is a steep learning curve, to be honest. Yeah. Hi, and welcome to the VFX Artist Podcast. This episode is split into two parts. This is part one of two. On today's episode, I have Michael Morgan, a senior animator with over 20 years of experience in the VFX industry. During today's discussion, I find out more about how Michael got into the industry, as well as discuss his experiences leading and supervising teams. We also go on to discuss what qualities he looks for in animators and discuss the common practices and mistakes animators do and more. I hope you enjoy the show. First of all, it's good to have you on the show. I've been trying to get you on for, for some time. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I think, the, um, yeah, the last time that we spoke, um, you you were tra you were leaving the country to, to go and work um, on the show. So, yeah, how, how, how did that go? How was that? Yeah, that was good. Um, yes, yeah, so the last time we spoke was what, last split well probably this time last year because yeah. yeah i went over to vancouver I was working with sony on spider-man no way home so that was okay yeah that was a great experience you know okay. being a spider-man fan for the longest time so mm. to be able to work on the last you know the most recent was definitely good i don't want to mm. i know it's been out for a while but um yeah there's a lot of spoilers that i could say which i, I don't want to do that but it was definitely yeah, yeah. it was a fun one to work on for sure. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So um yeah, just to give people context, can you just tell us who you are and just what you do? All right. So my name's Michael Morgan and I'm a three D animator. I work in well, I work in films now, I've been working in visual effects film for the last ten years. And then before that I was working in T V and video games. So I started off in video games back in 2000 and then 
adapted into different arenas. So yeah, most of the stuff I do is character and creature work and that's mm -hmm. what I focus on. So like I said, yeah. because I do films now, my main want and attraction is the animation side of it. So I like films, I like character performance, I like creature performance. So that's where I really gravitate my wants and desires to. So yeah, yeah. that's, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. So uh, did you, have you always wanted to see, to be an animator? How, how did, how did that journey begin or start? Yeah. All right. So yeah, I've not always wanted to be an animator. I've always wanted to draw. I've been drawing since probably the age of four. Well, mm -hmm. as long as I can remember. And so, yeah, it was all about what can I do, you know, drawing wise and mm -hmm. going through college, going through uni, it was always trying to keep my drawing skills, but you know, with, with parents and adults, it's like drawing's not going to get you anywhere. So right. you gotta do something more like be a doctor, lawyer, something that's making the money. And back then, you know, I'm an eighties child. So back in the eighties and nineties, animation wasn't really a big thing in the UK. Well, as far as I knew, it wasn't something that I even knew about that you could have as a career. So. Yeah. Like I said, I was thinking of how can I have this career in drawing, but at the same time, how do I actually make it so I can actually make money from it? And it was graphic design that people were telling me about because, you know, going to computers, the Apple Mac in the nineties and all that stuff. So I tried um, graphic design. So I went into college doing graphic design, advertising and stuff like that, photography. Mm -hmm. And then I went into uni doing multimedia design. And that's where I really found out that, you know what, I can do animation. So mm -hmm. it was 2D animation that I was studying in one of the modules. And that's what got me into animation, really, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, nice. Interesting. So how, yeah, so um, I'm just trying to recollect your journey. So are, are you able to, to tell us, um, I don't know, maybe which year you you... you you graduated from uni and, and how your journey was, I mean, how your journey into the industry was, how it yeah. happened. So me, I graduated in 99, 1999, yeah. the last yeah. century. So, <laughs> um, like I said, like I've always liked film. I've always liked animation, but the first Disney um, animated feature that I really enjoyed, I, probably I was about what, six, and I was less than 10 years old was Pinocchio. And that was a film that really, I really enjoyed. And that's what got me enjoying animation per se, you know, and then watching animated TV shows like He-Man, Thundercats, all that old school stuff and yeah. watching all the old anime. So I've always liked animation, but never saw it as a career. So when I was going into uni and doing graphic design, multimedia design, I chose those because they were very much about a sample base, you know, like going to the buffet and trying different things. So I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly. So I knew that mm -hmm. if I can go into a course that allows me to sample different things, then at least I can then fine tune it by the final year and know exactly what I'm doing in second or third year. So that's how I kind of live my life actually is sample, sample, sample. This is what I like. And then I'll pursue that in more depth. So, like I said, I graduated in 99, but it was 2D animation that I was focused on. Yeah. So in 99, everything changed, like a lot of the Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks. Back then, yeah. Toy Story, Toy Story 2, they were like really big um, films. So a lot of the industry, Hollywood was changing the game. They were stopping yeah. their whole 2D branch and going for the 3D. So Leo and Stitch was probably one of the last ones, Brother Bear, last Disney ones that were out. But a lot of their effort was going into Chicken Little and stuff like that. Okay. Obviously my time frame is a bit off, but it was a case of early 2000, they were starting to do all those films like Ants and all of that. That was the, the push. So what I'm trying to say there is all of my 2D learning was now a kind of thing of, is it going to be redundant? Because everyone's going into 3D. You know, everyone's learning soft image and 
Studio Max. I'm not even sure if they're around anymore. Well, they're not. Yeah, probably they're not. Fu- you know. Um, so, and it was Alias Wavefront and all this stuff that was 3D was the new thing. And so in my final year, seeing this change before I graduated, I had to then try to learn 3D. So once I did graduate, I knew 3D like a tiny bit, but then I had to go home and basically teach myself, you know, get those old books, how to learn Maya, I mean, Max 3 and stuff like that. And yeah, self teaching myself um, 3D software. So at the beginning I was doing my 2D animation, but trying to transfer that into the 3D world. So what I found was, was very, very difficult was you have to model your rigs. You know, you have to model your characters. You have to then to learn rigging before you can even get into animation. So it's like yeah. these whole new steps that I wasn't intending on. I just wanted to draw and make my animation. But now before I could do 3D animation back then, models, because online models, they weren't what they are today. Today you can just get a rig and boom, you can just jump animate straight away. But back in 2000, no, there wasn't these kind of rigs there. It was just literally, if you want to have a rig or something, you got to build it yourself basically. Mm-hmm. So it was 18 back then, it was MacGyver. Mm-hmm. You're down doing it from scratch. So you'll find, yeah, back in the days, you had to learn your modeling, you had to learn your rigging, and then you could finally learn your animation. So it was a very different kind of thing then. So when I finally got into the actual industry, it was probably about nearly a year after graduating. So, you know, I could like, once I graduated, I went to New York and I tried to go to MTV and work on a thing called Daria, you know, trying to do 2D animation. Randomly, I went into there and I just wanted to go in there and see it, look around. So me and my cousin went to the studio and they thought I had done a test. You know, because people don't just randomly go to the yeah, studio, yeah. but I did. And they asked me, oh, so you've, you've um, passed the test. And I was like, I just looked at my cousin and was like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've passed the test. <laughs> Knowing that I haven't even, I've just first time I've ever come to MTV. Yeah. And then they were like, okay, then. And they were showing me around. And then it came out that, okay, actually, I haven't done this test. I'm just trying to show you my um, portfolio from, from uni and stuff. And they, you know, basically said, we'll hold on to your portfolio. You've got some good stuff here and we'll get back to you. But the, the thing that was a problem back then was one, I'm not from the U S and I'm not from New York. So I couldn't just get a job like that because of all visa stuff and everything. Yeah. But yeah. So like I said, once I graduated, I went to New York to see my family, my cousins and everything just for the whole summer holiday. And then I came back to the UK. This is a long, long <laughs> I should try and cut this down. But um, okay. when I got back to the UK, I started just sending stuff out. And what I found was a lot of, um, when I say sending stuff out, there wasn't a lot of studios or places that I knew to send stuff. So I had to think, what do I enjoy? You know, what can I, as an animator or want to be an animator, what can I get myself into? And that was video games. So right. somehow I figured out that there's no MTV. So there's no nothing like that in the UK that I know of, but I play video games like crazy PS two or PlayStation was the thing at the time, resident evil, tomb Raider wipeout. So those are the things that I used to play. And I thought they've got animation in it. Let me try and contact those people and do, you know, see if I can get into 3d animation. And that's how my journey really began in the industry. It's like sending stuff out to studios in video games. All right. Oh, wow. <laughs> Amazing. A bit, <laughs> a bit long winded and off the track, no. but yeah. No. So, um, cause you, you said you, for, when you realized that you had to learn 3d, you, you started teaching yourself at home so would that imply that you at that time which is what 1999 2000 you had a, a home pc which was yeah 
capable enough to to run the software. So that's what I found out straight away after uni was you need a you need your own self. And right. what did I have back then? Yeah, I had a, my own workstation. Mm. And yeah, you had to invest in in your own software. At uni, I was like, I don't need one because you got it all at uni. So yeah. once I left the studio, I didn't ever need to do anything. Well, I thought mm -hmm. I didn't. But once you go home and you realize I've graduated and if I've got to mm -hmm. take this stuff seriously, I've got to have mm -hmm. my own workstation. And back then, you know, it's, about, it's all about having those big towers and having your monitor big, is it CTR? Mm -hmm. I don't know how to pronounce, but it's like big, massive. Yeah. Yeah. Monitors. Yeah, yeah. the monitors that are heavyweight. Do yeah. weightlifting on that, but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, um, was it was it easier to get in the industry at that time? Um, so actually, in... for me, for me, it's it's kind of strange because the industry right now, mm. like if you graduate now, there's so much work, there's so much opportunities now. I would say probably because I've been doing it for twenty years, I would say it's easier now because back then. Mm -hmm you had to be more of a, for me, I had to be a modeler. I had to rig and I had to animate. So I had to have free skills. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get in just as an animator back then. Right. And I can't say it's because it's because of many factors, but back then, especially going to video games, they were taking people that were artists that knew, right. um, 3d basically, that was what you needed to know. So it wasn't just about knowing animation. It was knowing how to helping rigging, helping modeling. So you had, you were a bit more of a, not a generalist, but you were more leaning that way as, as to, opposed to being a specialist. Whereas now you can be specialist. Specialist is what they want now. Whereas back then, 20 years ago, it was more, can you get your hands dirty in this? Can you get your hands dirty in that and help out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, you, so you've been, you, I mean, you, you've been a senior animator, um, as well as, um, a supervisor. So do you have a preference between those two? Yeah. Cause I always like to be hands on hands in, mm -hmm. I guess I just want to be in the trenches. So I do enjoy being more an animator. Right. Supervising. The reason why I flipped through doing lead or supervising is because I want to be I'm at a stage where I want to make sure that the team that I'm working with are getting the full attention, are able to grow. So it's like, if you've got a lot of juniors in your team, mm -hmm. unless you have someone who's helping them and guiding them and helping nurture and grow them, then it's going to be a case of you've got a lot of people that are going to be struggling. So it's kind of like if I'm leading and I know the team has a lot of juniors, like I said, or trainees that are coming in, I'm willing to help them because I know once they're strong, then the project's strong, the team's strong. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you can be on some teams where they only give the work to the top seniors and then everybody else is just kind of like cannon fodder. And that doesn't really make for a good team. So, you know, being in this game for 20 years and seeing the different kind of leaderships, I see those that really do look at their team, want to strengthen their team. And that's kind of what I want to emulate is I've been in projects where they're like, uh, we don't know how strong you are. Mm -hmm. We're not, we haven't got the time to help and train you. So, um, you get what you get. And the other then you'll see all these people that have been trained, have been around the block and more seasoned, they'll be doing all the good stuff and they, they don't have time to train you either. So, or some of them that do help and train, you look at that and go, this is how you strengthen the team. This is how you really make people grow by involving them. And that's why I would say, I like being on the trenches, in the trenches, but I'd like to be that person who's helping as well. Obviously I gotta do my own stuff. You know, I'm not gonna be there helping everyone else while I'm just not doing anything. It's yeah. a case of making sure that the team as a whole is growing. Mm -hmm. if that makes yeah, any sure. sense <laughs> it does yeah of course yeah it does because I, I mean i have when i started off um in so my entry into the industry was in 2011 
um, and I started off in in a small studio, and then moved on into the medium sized studio, and then I realized there was there was more time for for learning as well as to be more time to be to be thought stuff. Um, but lately, just working in the in the video in, in the film industry, the, everything just seems to be like yeah just, just churning out there's, there's no time yeah there's yeah. no time for there's no learning yeah, you, or you gotta be near yeah just dodging those bullets yeah yeah it's... i just want <laughs> i wonder how how juniors um yeah cope these days i mean i guess there's always a leader or supervisor to, to ask well that's the thing it's um you know when i got into film what did i one of the first films i worked on was probably the lone ranger I don't know when that was 2012 or 2011, but that was such a small team. There was literally probably 10 or 10 animators on that. And so I had it good with coming in, it was that MPC. So it's a big studio, but the team on that project was quite small. And we just focused on the Scorpions. And because it was so small, you got to know the team, you got to know your project. It was just like, I thought that's how film was, okay? Then my next project in film was the total opposite, was Guardians of the Galaxy. And that was humongous. You know, you're looking at nearly 100 animators. So I'm going from 10 animators and just doing some math, math, you know, math, and then it becomes 100 and you run a big, massive Marvel project. Yeah. And it's all character performance, action, and, you know, you got to do Rocket the Raccoon, you got to do Groot. And you want to get stuck in, but at the same time, you've got to learn about visual effects and how you're doing live action plates. You've got to learn the pipeline. You've got to learn how to do all this stuff. So it's not just animation. You've got to understand the scenes and how it works in the sequence, all this. And I'm fairly new to film. I've done animation before. I've done TV, I've done video games, but this is now another beast. Mm -hmm. And you start to realize oh my gosh, this is all new to me again. It's another new kind of environment. And like I said, I've got 10 years behind me. And then you've got people who just come straight out, out of school, online school, brick and mortar school, and they're in the same trench and you see them and they're like, these in headlights, do you know what I mean? It's like, you've got a hundred animators, you've got probably about 10 leads, you know, the way they div it up. But then you've got to ask yourself, has the lead, because it's a fast paced show, has the lead got time to teach or train all of these juniors or all these mids to get up to the standard? Because your leads are up there. Do you know what I mean? They've been doing this film stuff for, for time. And then you've got graduates who are just coming in and they're just looking at them like, oh my gosh, mm. what the? And the lead can't do their work for them, but he's got to train them. She's got to help them. She's got to do all this. So, I don't envy graduates now, actually, because it yeah. is a, it is a steep learning curve, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what what do you think is the best way for for animators to to get their foot in the door these days, um, or for someone to transition into from a department that they may have been in for for some time? So, I definitely, I'm always learning. You know, it's, it's all about, you can't teach old dog new tricks. So mm -hmm. I believe you can, it's hard teaching a puppy. So you, you gotta, you gotta always be learning. You always gotta be going for what's, what's happening. And what I mean by that is like, I teach animation, but that teaching of animation also teaches me, if that makes sense. It helps me learn animation all the time, keep fresh with it and also know what the, current trends are keeping up to date with what's happening because you can get redundant pretty quickly if you don't see what's happening. So we're, we're saying that I recommend to everyone, no matter where they are in, the, in their levels, always keep growing, keep learning. So when you're a student and you're, you're um, looking at animation as an option or visual effects or however you want to phrase it, find out what it is you want to do. Do you want to get into animation per se? Do you want to get into 2D, 3D? And really hone your skills on that. Like, 
be broad at first and then start to narrow down. Like, I'm probably contradictory to a lot of people. People, a lot of people say, start where you want to be, you know, like be as pinpoint as possible. But I think when you're in your twenties, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to be so niche, so, yeah. so specialized that mm -hmm. the more you go on, you're getting more and more specialized. It's like learning the human body. If you mm -hmm. only specialize on the eye, say, mm -hmm. then you'll never know how it's connected to the rest of the body. So I always think, sure. think of the whole body and then start to specialize where you want to, when you want to be. And that's right. for me with animation. So mm. as I go in a long winded way, I would say again, it's focus on being big, come down and then keep learning that skill. Mm -hmm. So it's constantly just absorbing it, knowing that you can animate in games, you can animate in film, you can animate in commercials. Is it the arena that is what you gravitate to or is it the practice? Like for me, like I was saying earlier, I enjoy animation. So if the fact that I'm working in visual effects is mm -hmm. only, it's like a byproduct, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm not in visual effects because I like explosions and all of those things. It's only because I enjoy animation and I like storytelling and I like film. So. I could jump from a visual effects movie to an animated feature simply because I enjoyed the, the art of animation. Mm -hmm. So when you go into, like I said, again, a student, you want to know that kind of off the bat is your gravitation to something because you like the art, the skill, the um, art of animation, or is it because you enjoy visual effects itself? And that, if that's what draws you in, then really look and, and get as much information about that and start showing people that that's what you're about and that's what you, you're gravitating to. Because the more people that see what you enjoy, they're able to then show you opportunities that are out there. All right, yeah, sure. Yeah. What what traits do you see in, in those that go on to, to be successful? Um, I guess obsession, you know, some right. some, just, um, you know, obviously it's your definition of what is successful, but it's a case of people that are really able to find opportunities that you just don't, you think to yourself, how did they get that opportunity and how did they find out about, how did they get involved? It's because they've one, they've got the skill. Okay. Mm -hmm. But also they're able to show people around what they are about. And once people know that, so, you know, you've got a diamond that you've made, unless people know about it, nobody's really going to be able to see it. Nobody's going to be able to really promote it and show others. And that's what it is. It's like word of mouth. It's about others looking and, and saying, we really see this person and we want to introduce them to someone who we think they can connect well with. And I think that's something that people that I find successful they manage to attract the right kind of people because they're going out there and they're showing people what they're about, what their work's about, what, what their potentials are and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So. Oh yeah, sure. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so do you have any, any specific qualities that you, you look for or, or desire in, in animators on your team? Me, I just basically look at people and go, do they enjoy animation? Are they hungry for this, mm -hmm. this art form? Because it doesn't have to be the project. You don't have to be hungry for the project per se, mm -hmm. but if you love animation, then any project that has animation in it is going to mm -hmm. be something that you enjoy. You know, it's for instance, Spider-Man. I enjoy Spider-Man, but a lot of people might go, Oh, Spider-Man, another Spider-Man. Oh God, we've been seeing Spider-Man since the sixties. So they might be fed up with that, but if they enjoy animation, they enjoy action, they enjoy the whole kind of vibe, then that will be a nice new challenge for them or a nice challenge full stop. So I'm looking at people and going, you know, if I'm leading on the team and if I can get people on the team, it's the love of animation, character performance, action, just trying to bring things to life. If that's what they enjoy, then you know that they're going to bring the goods to the table. Whereas if it's someone who's like, ah, oh, it's just a job. Mm, yeah. 
then you know already you're pulling teeth, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Do you do you, do you know why um two two D animation was I'd say sort of made redundant um in the end? Is it is it because three D was much more easier, or was it yeah? What what made that transition happen? Me, I have no idea. For me, yeah. I, at the time, and my thoughts were. 3D is fresh. It's it's the new thing, you know. Orange is the new black. It's one of those things of the way they were doing 2D back then. They got into a rut. They got into a formula, and it was very much, a, you know, you got your singing, your song, and your dance. You got your cliche kind of movement. It wasn't until like think about it with Disney films. You're looking at The Emperor's New Groove, which was around that time. Lilo and Stitch. They are probably the only two films that I can say off the bat, probably Brother Bear, that are not the same as the Disney formula. And they were made at the end of the 90s. So if you look at a lot of Disney films from Snow White, Cinderella to even the, um, well, a lot of them, I can't even think now, but mm-hmm. they kind of follow the trend. You know, you've got all your Disney princesses and stuff like that. Whereas the ones I mentioned, Emperor's New Groove and Lido and Stitch, they were so different. Lido and Stitch, think about it, is in Hawaii. It's got people that, at the time, they weren't doing um, animated shows on people from Hawaii at all. None, you know, I can't remember the saying now, um, family, you know, and you've got all the character designs were not cliche Disney designs. Everything was so different. So, Going back to your question about why 2D was was going into a rut or becoming redundant, I think it's because there weren't fresh ideas at the time. People were just churning out the same old, same old and thinking that people were getting bored of it. And then because Toy Story was so big, uh, you got to think Pixar back in the 90s. Yeah. Pixar in early 2000, amazing stuff. Yeah. And they put so much energy into that, that that's why Pixar in many ways surpassed Disney. They were, were producing things like um, Monsters Inc. See, I'm trying to, and Incredibles and stuff like that. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Even Bugs Life, all of that stuff was CG. People thought you can't do that in 2D, but you probably could. Because when you think about it, if you go to look at all the behind the scenes of Pixar, all that stuff was in 2D form and before they even made it into 3D. And obviously the storytelling was amazing back then. So answering your question in in the best way I can, I would say it's all about fresh ideas. The ideas in 2D were getting stale and people thought 3D was the new, fresher, more vibrant way of going. So they invested a lot more and really pushed to make it work. And they definitely did back in those days. If you look at the early 2000 animated films, you know, hands down for me, because it's probably my time as well. They're far greater, I'm biased, <laughs> but they were a lot better then than they are now. Like the thing that changed the game now is Spider-Verse, you know, because that's added a new leash, leash of life into animation. Like when you look at it, you've got back in the early 2000s, you had, um, Pixar, DreamWorks, Disney weren't really doing much stuff until about, what, Tangled? They had Chicken Little, they had Meet the Robinsons, but look at those two films and then look at Tangled and you see just how different they got once they hit Tangled because that's when they they started meeting their sweet spot. That's what, mm-hmm. this is all obviously my perspective on things, but mm-hmm. it was all about Pixar for the first um, 10 years of, in the 2000s. It was about what they were doing. And then you start to see from Tangled, you started to see Disney start to take over and do what they needed to do. In that sense, DreamWorks was doing their thing. Obviously DreamWorks was bringing out some stuff that was yeah. on point from, oh man, um, <laughs> you know, Ants, not the greatest looking show, you know, story was good. but the story was strong, you know, we're not even going to mention Shark Tales, but, um, 
you know, that was, they were doing their name, was it Finding Nemo was Pixar, and then you got Shark Tales, which was, oh my gosh, not great. But at least DreamWorks were making mistakes. They were making big mistakes, but they were making stuff that then led them to Shrek, which obviously then Shrek and one, two, three, four, Shrek forever. But mm -hmm. it's the whole thing of what I'm trying to say is you saw that initially they had ideas and they were pouring them in. And then I feel like Shrek got people and Toy Stories in sense, got people on this whole franchise thing of let's start making sequels. And that became a bit too much, you know, like people are making more and more yeah. sequels and carrying on that. But in saying that, there's a lot of contradiction in what I'm saying, but I always think back, Pixar, they didn't ever make any sequels. They were always, the only sequel was Toy Story. But what they were making was, they felt like Toy Story 1, 2 and 3 was necessary to just, mm -hmm. you know, push the story along. Yep. Then they had all these other films like Up and Inside Out, all these films that they were making that they never made sequels to. They were just making a story because they wanted to make that story. And when you look at that, that's why Pixar for the longest has always been a place where people think, oh my gosh, their stories are amazing. Cause they're not just trying to build a franchise as per se. Yeah. Well, that's how it appears. You don't know the behind the scenes, but yeah. Yeah. that was what I took away. And the same with Tangled when Disney were doing it. But then once you start seeing these, we've got this formula and then start making that formula again, 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 then it just becomes like 2D. It becomes very, oh, uh, we've seen this all before and nothing's new. You know, we're seeing like when, uh, what was it? The Minions came out. What was it before that? Despicable Me. Yeah. Now that was fresh. In my eyes, it was nice to have the villain and these little minions. But what was a little bit scary was once they made the whole minion film, you knew that it was going to be minions, minions for life. And it's like, when you get onto that kind of thing, it's a dangerous track to go on because you know, it's just going to be minions make money and it becomes money over project really. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, um, do you think Maya will remain the, the industry standard for, for animators? I think, um, until basically they decide it's not, then yeah, it's, it's one of those things of back in the days, you know, soft image was never the standard, but it was one that a lot of animators enjoyed more mm -hmm. in video games. 3ds max was one that they enjoyed more, but Maya became because of maybe films, it became the main go-to. But people are saying Blender, Blender's coming out and giving Maya a run for its money. So when, when industry follows a trend and that becomes the one that they go with, then we can never say what's going to be, what's going to be what. Right now, Maya looks like it's not going anywhere, but you know how it is. Nothing looks like it's going anywhere. Like Blockbusters didn't look like it was going anywhere. You know, yeah. who's going to invest in love film and then it becomes Netflix and boom, Netflix is now the number one thing. Blockbusters in mm -hmm. most generations would turn around and go blockbusters. What's that? Even like Nokia, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm an old guy. So Nokia was <laughs> the, the phones of the time. Now yeah. who owns a Nokia or Nokia? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. You never know. What? Yeah. Would you, would you hire an animator if, if you liked their work, but they had never used Maya? Yeah. So this is, a, um, it all depends on if you have training in place. So you see someone with amazing talent, like think about it. I know they say when people work at DreamWorks back in the days or Pixar, those are proprietary software. So they don't use Maya. They probably do now. I don't know how it stays. Mm -hmm. So. Software is something you can learn. It's, it's kind of like, you know, if, if you've worked on different instruments, you probably can 
recalibrate onto the next one if it's just a different brand. It's not going to be so big of a difference that you can't, it's not going to take away your artistic skills. So yeah. as long as you understand animation, then you can transfer that onto any software. That's my belief. So you just need that software training. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just quick personal question. I'm just wondering, um, yeah, what your parents think about what you, you ended up doing as a career in the end. Cause I think you said at the beginning, I mean, usually, um, yeah, I mean, at least for yeah. me, yeah, in, in being an African or at least most African uh, parents tend to want to guide their kids to do stuff that they, <laughs> they, they would like them to do. So I'm just wondering, yeah, what your parents thought and, and how they adapted to what you ended up settling for. Yeah. So with my parents being yeah. born in Jamaica and then mm -hmm. coming over to the UK, mm -hmm. it's very much very old school. Like my grandparents, they only know about doctors, nurses, lawyers, business, that mm -hmm. this art stuff, what the, is what's art, who, who makes a living out of drawing. So mm -hmm. back in the days, I would say my mom was more supportive and is more supportive because it's something that growing up as well, I grew up as a Rastafarian. So it's more open-minded. Okay. It's, it's the case of, yeah, this, this kid knows he's going to know what he, he wants to do. Now, as my parents said, it was separate. My dad was more like, he needs to actually do something more than this drawing because this drawing is not going to get him anywhere. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah, I would say one parent is for it and one parent's not. And my dad's mm -hmm. side of the family is more like, he needs to really stop this drawing. Like I had, I had um, some uncles be like, he needs to stop playing with toys. He's, he's nine years old. He's, he needs to... <laughs> you know, get his He-Man figurines and throw them in the bin, you know, this kind of stuff, because they don't want you to be a child. Some people, it's like some adults are very much, you're going to become an adult yourself. You need to stop this whimsical imagination kind of stuff and get a job. Now, fortunately for me, my mom has never been like that, but I've got uncles, aunts from both sides of the family that are very yeah. Jamaican, Caribbean, you know, African very much about you need to have a career and this drawing thing is not a career now it's come to you know fruition that oh you actually can make a little bit of money from this you can have a life from so now you, you're hearing different stories but you talk to them 20 30 years ago they weren't singing the same song so it's like you've got to show and prove to yourself before you can prove to others that this is what you want to do and mm -hmm. i would definitely say like today, you see so many people getting into animation, especially like from African, Caribbean, from cultures that were, were kind of like, how can I say, this was not something that was really pushed in their direction. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, you growing up, like I know for me, I grew up on Japanese animation. Like yeah. I'm this black kid from Caribbean background mm -hmm. in like Hansworth in Birmingham, like yeah. in an environment where you're watching Japanese cartoons, people looking at you like, what the heck are you watching? <laughs> this is, this makes no sense. But yeah. you know, once, um, what's his name? Akira became popular. Then my fist of the North star and everything, people would come to me and go, Oh my gosh, you know about it. It's like, as soon as it becomes popular in the mainstream, yeah. then all of a sudden what you were doing 10 years before, okay, we'll give you, you know, a bligh on that then. Obviously it's okay, yeah. but you got to go with what your gut says. If you enjoy it, go with it. Don't have to wait for the mainstream to tell you that this is the thing to do. So, yeah, yeah. I always go yeah. off on a tangent, but I try to get back. No, <laughs> no, that's all. It's great. So, um, animation for VFX versus a full animated feature, which do you prefer? Um, and what skills are required for either of them? So me, I actually enjoy doing as much animation as possible. 
So, mm-hmm. and it's, it's a hard one because whenever I think of visual effects, even for me who works in visual effects is a majority of the work I do, I think of live action plates, you know, you've got to make sure everything's being filmed and then you work on it. Okay. Um, and then I think of live action that was, I worked on a film called The Martian. Is it The Martian? Yeah. Um, and that's probably the worst experience of a film that I worked on. And I tell you why, it was probably the best as in it got awards and it got all this stuff. But as an animator, I was animating like sphere, you know, like a, a spaceship going around in rotation, rotating Mars or whatever, things like that don't exp- in, you know, inspire me. They don't get me excited about doing animation, but that's what I think of when I think of visual effects. I think of stuff that looks very realistic and very, fo- you know, photorealistic and it looks amazing. But for me as animator, I don't strive to do that. What I want to do, you know, like you're saying, is it features or visual effects? I would love to work on God, you know, any Guardians of the Galaxy film because it's character performance. It's got Rocket the Raccoon, it's got Groot, it's got all of that stuff. And it's also a film that I would actually go and watch. So that's the ideal thing for me. If it was full on feature, then you've got Spider-Verse, which is full full feature, full 3D. But these are the two kind of, they're kind of opposite and at the same time, very similar, but they're one's live action and one's fully CG. Which one would I think is better than the other? As an animator, I actually would gravitate to both, if that makes sense. Okay. You know, something like The Incredibles, I really enjoy. But visual effects wise, I wouldn't go for stuff that's, for me personally, I'm not a very realistic visual effects person. So I don't go for projects that are so hyper-realistic that I'm a slave to the um, the reference. So, you know, when you have to do the reference down to a T and you think to yourself, Mm -hmm. all right, you've got the two references, this is the real, and this is you animated and they look exactly the same. To me, that as an animator, that doesn't fulfill me. If I was doing the, the modeling, the grooming, the lighting, I would feel more like, oh my gosh, I've made it look realistic. But as an animator, I would feel like technically that's amazing, but how much do I feel like I got to put imagination and some entertainment into it? I really couldn't because I had to stay as close to the reference as possible. So those kind of things, they, you know, rewind it. They're good for a practice where you really own your skill or hone your skill and you understand mechanics, you understand about the creature and the character performance from that. But mm-hmm. it's not something I want to always do because I would want to have that. You build on that. And you want to learn how to express that into a more exaggerated form, if that makes any sense. So answering your question, it's not uh, like this over this. I just enjoy animation. So it's a case of if it's fully featured and it's a, it's got a lot of story, it's got a lot of Uh character performance that they want to inject, then I would love to be on it. And the same goes for visual effects. Uh So like, um, Like I look at a lot of the films that I've been fortunate to work on, so say Venom. Venom, I worked on the final act and that was fully CG. So it was a live action film, but basically it was a full CG animated film. And at that point, the same with Spider-Man, like the worked on the final act again, fully CG, you know, some live action plates there, here and there. The work, the project I'm working on now, which is Pinocchio, live action, but a lot of CG character performance. So it's a case of those are the projects I really push to go into because I just want to be, I do like feature, but I want it to have heart and soul to it. I'm not into this, um, just making minions. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing against minions, <laughs> but it's just, that's the kind of thing. I, yeah, I don't yeah, like that kind of feature. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you have to work on a, on a VFX show, um, and you have to, you're, you're asked to reproduce, um, rea- realism into your characters. 
um, do you prefer acting it out or and referencing that, or do you think having, having motion capture uh, as a base is is the best way to achieve realism for animation? So yeah, there's um, those are two things in the sense of me. I'm very much if if I have my own way, mm-hmm. I do video reference. So mm-hmm. you know, really try and play with that performance. Mm-hmm over motion capture because motion capture is good as a base as well. And then you can start scrapping away and doing whatever. But a lot of the time when you, when you're given motion capture, you kind of like, cause you've got something that's kind of perfect. It's done. It's hard to rip it up, scrap it up and then start injecting your own thing. But you have to, you, a lot of the times motion capture is there as, as a base that you play with, yeah. you work on top, and you, you re recreate something that wasn't there. But a lot of the time, again, it's different projects, different way of working motion capture. I worked on um, cinematic for, um, what was the cinematic called? Not League of Legends. It was Magic the Gathering. And that's, I've never worked on motion capture like that before. It was a case of, in fact, it was very much like Planet of the Apes. The motion capture is so fine tuned and edited by, you know, the motion capture editors that when it comes to you as an animator, it's like, don't touch it, right. you know, tweak the hands and the contacts that for me, it hurts my soul because mm-hmm. as an animator, like I said, I want to get my hands dirty. I want to get in there, yeah. give me something, I'll rip it to shreds and recreate and build it. But if you give me some motion capture that's done, then I'm looking at you like, like, like a little kid going, or oh, what do you want me to do with it? It's already done. What, yeah. what am I supposed to do with it? So yeah. if I've got an motion capture that I can rip up and I'm using it as a guide, then that's okay. But that's why I tend to want to have my own video reference. If I can get on a show where do your own performance, be as sincere, listen to the dialogue, listen to the performance, do what you can for a sincere um, performance here, then that's what I want to do. Cause one, it's teaching me as well to learn how to get the best in acting. So, you know, you got to start watching films. You, you start really looking at your craft beyond the animator and you start looking at these, what's so good about De Niro in taxi or why is DiCaprio so good at what it does? Why is Nicole Kidman so effective with Reese Witherspoons in this? You start looking at and you're like, Oh my gosh, this looks and feel so natural. And this is what you start absorbing. Whereas if you've just got motion capture, I don't feel you get that same feel to it. I could be wrong, but that's just my take on it. It's because you want to look and really, well, to be fair, I am kind of wrong there because the guys I worked with on apes, they work with motion capture and they understand all the face, all the body, like the animators, really take that and they can tell you what muscles you're moving in your face and stuff like that. So it's having something as a base and really learning about it and really taking it in. So trying to answer your question, I prefer reference (laughs) over more cat. Yeah, sure. Mm. Yeah, sure. Um, I've got a vague question. It might be a bit too broad, but I'm just wondering how you approach a new sequence or a shot. So how do I approach? It's always going back to the whole planning. So it's a case of, so say we get assigned a shot. What I would do is I'll, I'll actually just watch the whole sequence, no matter how big or how small it is, I'll watch it. And I'm trying to figure out what's the character's state of mind in that moment. And you know, who was interacting with what he's got, what's happened before him and what's coming after and trying to make sure. I'm not just doing a performance just because, oh my gosh, this will be so good with overlap and all. I'm not caring about animation per se in that point. I'm thinking about what's the state of the character. And so once I've got that in play, I'm going out there, you know, I've written down what it's it's saying, what it's thinking. It's all about when people talk about subtext, it's about trying to understand the character's um, motives. You know, when you hear that whole thing of what's my motivation when the actors say that, 
it literally is trying to go to that and say, what am, what am I here to do? What am I here to, to, um, to make the audience feel? So mm -hmm. you go away, do as much video reference as possible. Like even in video reference, I don't just get the clip and go listen to it and then just do my performance for that. I've got to really think what is, what's going on. I just press record and I'm, I've got my working out going on and I'm still letting it record. I'm not pressing every stop, press, stop, press. Mm -hmm. I'm just letting it run for a bit. It's a waste of footage, but at least I know I've got into my, to my flow for a good minute or so. Maybe I'll pause it for a bit, but I'll do this for about half an hour just so I can really capture some stuff on video that I've, I've forgot about that the video is rolling. I've just let it roll and I'm just doing my own thing. And then later on, I'll start editing it down and seeing what I've got. But when we try and press start, press start and all that, we just never get into the motion or into the actual character because we're so trying to figure out in our head, is this a good performance? So that's the first thing I try and do is just try and get into character, record it, do my reference. And then, yeah, just set up the scene as, as we would just one, how technical is this scene? Is it a lot of interaction with other characters? And then you start to think of animation. All right, I've got to have this character touching this, 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 and, this, and how am I going to block it through to the end of the sequence? You know, I don't go straight ahead. I always block the key poses. So I need to know what's happening at the beginning, say middle towards the end and see how I'm going to get there. I used to be an animator who did straight ahead. So I would just like, you know, when you see stop motion, we, it's like, you're just going and where I end up, I'm trying to end up here. I might, I might end up there but, and try and get back down there. But it's like, once I block it out now in a more kind of organized way, like building pillars, I know how to get to where, you know, my destination a lot more controlled. I guess sure. Um, so how, how, <laughs> how important is the, the performance? How, I mean, I know the performance is, is very important, but just, I'm just trying to think about person who might not be strong at performing or they might be, I don't know, they might be shy. Yeah. Yeah. Acting in, in, in front of a camera. So how, yeah, how does how does that affect um, the the quality of an animated performance if, if yeah, the animator if, if is shy? Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, even with our shows, like what you can do is you can find people in your team that love performing. You know, there was a guy in Blue Sky who used to put up his um, video reference online, and you saw the progression of his shot. Now you know that. He obviously loves performance. He loves to get into character. So if you work with someone like that, you could ask them, could you act out my shot for me? And you'll get their reference, you know, that they've created and you'd work off that because okay. it's not about you having to do everything yourself. Like working on guardians, a lot of the stuff was, um, in the first one was from the leads, like what we did actually as a team in some of the um, teams that we we'd all go down as a, as a small team. So about 10 of us and we'd as a whole team act out our sequence and different people doing different things. People that were more comfortable would do the stuff. And that's something that I took on when I became a lead, I would then when I was in Montreal looking at Artemis, I would get the team because it's good to make the team feel like they're involved and mm -hmm. some people are shy. It's like, I don't want to do this at all. So you, you don't force them into it, but you'll have other people who would love to jump about and get involved and they would, you know, be recording and, and making the, the reference. But that person who's shy is would then all of a sudden you start to see them become the director and go, Oh no, my shot, I need it from this angle. And, and you know, there's that interaction and the person who's happy to do the, the action would do it. And the person who's shy is would then be directing them and saying, could you do it a little bit like this, a little bit like that. Right. And you'd have that going on with the team. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be behind in front of the camera. You can just be behind it. I 
for sure. Okay. Um, yeah. How do you um, manage stressful days? Um, yeah. But I guess most important, most importantly, um, like what are the key factors that make a task or a day um, be stressful? So yeah, well, to be fair, animation is stressful. You know, for me, I feel like sometimes this, you know, you got an, you get a note and it's the most simple note ever. And four hours have gone by and you're like, what the heck is going on? This, it's not working. That can stress you out. And, right. you know, to try and get around stress for me is just knowing that, like, it, it's kind of a strange thing. Like, especially I'm working from home. So what's actually good about that is I have my family that I can take a break, get away from the computer and just like, even though we're in some, some kind of lockdown, you still can get up, go out, get some fresh air before coming back to it. Because I feel like the more you get away from the computer, get away from the thing that's stressing you, mm -hmm. you clear your head, even if it's just for 10, 15 minutes, when you come back, you've now figured out because your head's not spinning. You know, if I sat here and I'm stressed and I'm trying to get this thing sorted, it just doesn't come. You know, like when someone's, uh, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, You, mm -hmm. the more you think about it, you just can't get it. So when you get away, you got some people that you're close to, you hang out with them for a few minutes and then boom, it's like that eureka moment. Oh, actually, you know what? Um, I gotta get back to this now because I really, and that's kind of how I deal with the stress thing is yeah. getting away, coming back and being refreshed because sitting on things, spinning it, it's just not going to work. So yeah, I would definitely say, cause animation for me, you know, I say I've been doing it for 20 years and you know, I feel crap sometimes. Like some days it's like, this is just not working. How much do I really know what I'm doing? And right. that stresses me out as well. It's like, hmm. it's, it's a double edged thing. It's like, I've been doing this for so long. I should be better than this. Um, how come this is still, this thing is still annoying me, this little thing. But then once you get away, come back to it and you're doing it, you can have a day where it just goes, well, a lot of the hours, not a whole day, but you know, it's going well. You've got four hours, you know, from say nine till 12, you're like, oh my gosh, you, you raise your head and you look and the stuff's working. Mm -hmm. But you wasn't even thinking about it. You was just in the zone. So it's kind of like, yeah. Trying to just switch off is what I probably would mm -hmm. say is don't overthink things. And it's, yeah. it's easier said than done because we overthink to the point once you, once you are sitting there trying to think it, that means get up and go and go, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of guys that I know that go for cigarette breaks. And I know those guys that smoke, they are actually, some of the guys who smoke are more effective. And I put that down to because they leave their desk, mm -hmm. you know, people might think, oh yeah, but they're smoking. It's more about they're taking a break from this whole area and they're yeah. getting up, you know, in the office, going out, they come back and boom, boom, boom. They're doing what they need to do. And that's, mm -hmm. I definitely believe in clearing your head, stepping away and then coming back. Yeah.